Maryland Morning. I'm Tom Hall. Andrew Oak is known as the first ladies' man. His new book is called Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. WYPR's Lisa Morgan sat down with Andrew Oak last week. Well, Andrew Oak, welcome to Maryland Morning. Thank you very much. So tell me how you first got involved with America's First Ladies. Yeah, it, it's kind of, I fell backwards into a project for C-SPAN. I was one of the producers on First Ladies Influence and Image. Um, I grew up around the Washington, D.C. area, so I'd always been politically minded as people are in this area, but never focused on history or, or these women in particular. But when I did this project for C-SPAN, my job specifically was to go out in the field, travel to every house, library, museum, train station, cemetery, church, school for every first lady, Martha Washington through Michelle Obama. With C-SPAN's good name and an all-access pass, I had had the, the country's most fantastic and historical collections right there at my fingertips and recorded it all to bring back for the live show. And I just basically fell in love with every one of these first ladies and their stories. They're just remarkable. It's funny because I think a lot of us, we hear first ladies, and of course we think Michelle Obama now, or we, there's been some that come to mind, Martha Washington, Dolly Madison. Of but, course. But you found that all of these women, and in fact in the title of the book, Unusual for Their Time, that, that many of these women, or, or all of these women, had something about them that made them fairly special. What was that like to find that out? That, that's an excellent point. I, I, you know, we all conjure an image when I say first lady. Like you say, is it Michelle Obama? Is it Jacqueline Kennedy? Is it Nancy Reagan? Is it Martha Washington? Everyone knows that five or ten. But there's over 40 women that have served as first lady or official hostess for a relative's administration. And during these travels, at some point in time, at some location, and it was different in almost every case, these women became real to me. They stepped out of the pages of history books. They came off the oil paintings. There's something fun about going to a location where it's the most important thing to the person who might lead you into Absolute. this historic house. And you Absolutely. get this extra access. As you mentioned, you're working for C-SPAN. People want to give you all access. What was that like for you to show up at a location that you knew nothing about and then spend the day kind of immersing yourself? In no, it? That's, a, that's a great question. And, and, and no one's asked me that specifically yet, but that, that's exactly it. I was a one-man band for this, this aspect of the show. There was a whole team of producers that were doing everything to make the 90-minute show happen in D.C., and I was the one out in the field. So I would have a phone interview with someone that I'd never met before, never worked with before, pack up seven bags of gear, and pinball all across the country. If you go to my website, firstladiesman.com, there's a journey page, and it's got a map, and it shows where I traveled. And at the end of this thing, the executive producer and I looked at the map on my website, and we were both like, that didn't really happen, did it? And it didn't happen by yourself. I mean, like, just to carry seven bags alone is a job in itself. So I would get to this place, and I would be set up for a full day of work with someone that I'd never worked with before. But as you mentioned, they're working at their spot in many cases because that president is their guy or that first lady is is their gal. And, and they are so tuned into that person that they're going to tell you the story better than anyone else because they're there to preserve the image, the legacy of, of those individuals. So when you go to the the Harding House in Marion, Ohio, I mean, the, the woman there, the director there is uh, Sherry is her name. Uh, all these people, they pop, there's so many women running around in my head, it's crazy. But Sherry Sherry is the, is the director there, and she will take you through and tell you the part of the Harding stories that no one else will tell you. And you can see these artifacts in a lot of these houses, that house specifically, it looks like these people just went out to the store. I mean, there's still jewelry and jewelry boxes where they left it, clothes hanging in closets. As we get older as a country, we know that the preservation of this history is more and more important, so the collections get more vast and the evidence of these people's lives is more evident. But um, I wanted to know not only about the White House years, but before the White House, they're all little girls. They're all young women. They're all girlfriends, wives, mothers, sometimes even grandmothers before they get into the White House. And there's so much stuff out there to learn about all these women at all these locations that when you do go to one of these off the map, sort of off to the side places, it, it's so incredible because it's all brand new. On 88.1 WIPR, it's Maryland Morning. I'm Lisa Morgan. My guest is Andrew Oak. His new book is Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. So you mentioned doing that kind of travel 
not all of us can take the time sure. <laughs> and have the time or, or, or being made to for our jobs go to all these places. Right. But we can go along with you in this book. And I, how did you decide <laughs> the structure uh, to put it together this way, like like we are actually traveling with yeah. you? Yeah. Oh, good. I'm, gl- <laughs> I'm glad you... Yes, mission accomplished, because that was the idea. Um, when I was doing the work, when I was doing the travel... The thing that people found so amazing about this project was not only the women and the stories, but the process. And I think in today's day and age of director's cuts and behind the scenes and YouTube. And so in the written form, I can give access to what I did for a year and two months, which was exactly that. Travel all over the country in places that people wouldn't get to go. I felt also when these collections were opened up to me and I saw the rarities and the, and the stuff that will just never be on display because by its own existence, it's destroying itself. Dresses, jewelry, paper, documents, everything that I did have a great responsibility given this access. I needed to let other people know this and people that couldn't travel to these out of the way places. So I structured the book very carefully that it would be sort of a fun travel log that by the end you're like, oh, wow, I learned a bunch of stuff because that's exactly what happened to me. On 88.1 WYPR, it's Marilyn Morning. I'm Lisa Morgan. My guest is Andrew Oak, also known as the First Ladies Man. And we're talking about his new book, Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies. Now, Another interesting thing that I did not know that you seem to come to realize as you met all of these first ladies was that many of our presidents, who we think of as great men, their stature was raised by they (laughs) they, they married up, as (laughs) we say. They did marry up. That's sort of an interesting little fact about our our founding fathers. It it really is. Right from the beginning, George Washington could not have done what he did to make America America without Martha Washington. If we look at the Revolutionary War and the winter encampments that Martha Washington, at at great risk, and, and I mean, she had a target on her back. She's the wife of the man who's leading the revolution. She traveled days, weeks, months, miles to get to George Washington and his winter encampments because he says it's written in letters that have been preserved, luckily, that he can't think straight without her. He He needs her around. He needs this comfort. He needs this sounding board kind of thing. But... George Washington is not Martha Washington's first husband. She married Daniel Park Custis back in Williamsburg before she met George Washington, but he's much older, Custis is, and he's much wealthier. The marriage almost didn't happen. It's a long story that I won't get into. It's in the book, but just know that Martha Dandridge had to marry Daniel Park Custis to be in the position to be a widow that George Washington would fall in love with to get married so America could start. If we wanted to play like the Back to the Future game and go and mess with things and tweak, if that doesn't happen, we're not sitting here. She has, when 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 her first husband dies, Martha Washington is in charge of over 8,000 profitable tobacco acres in, in and around Williamsburg, uh, real estate of, a, I don't know, a quarter to a third of the town of Williamsburg, which is a serious hub at the time. And she's got over four times the governor's salary in silver, in cash on hand at her home. She She's young. She's very, very attractive. There are, there are paintings that go back to see. She's a young 26-year-old, very attractive and uber wealthy for the times. So from there on up through amazing men. I mean, you look at like uh, the story of of Lou Hoover and Herbert Hoover, the, the way they started together is, I mean, he's an orphan. She's not from much money. They're both from Iowa, but they meet under strange circumstances in at Stanford University, and they become one of the wealthiest couples in, in history and the first of only two presidential administrations not to take salary because they've got so much money. They're so successful, but they're very giving with it, very philanthropic. We just don't know a lot of this because the depression comes in. But these are the things you find out about these people as human beings, not just our president and first lady. Another thing that I found reading through this was that sometimes, okay, they're marrying up and that sounds very practical indeed, but also that there was a lot of love. There was a lot of these relationships were based on love and mutual respect and admiration and people had a a good match and a good life together. Again, we don't have to go very far. I mean, I mentioned George Washington couldn't be without Martha Washington, things like that. But when Abigail Adams dies, John Adams writes to a friend. I think this might even have been the letter to Thomas Jefferson. I'm almost positive it is. He writes, if only I could lie down beside her and die myself. I mean, 
These were life partners all the way up through and to, I mean, I, you look at Barbara Bush and uh, George H.W. Bush and Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan, Michelle Obama and, and Barack Obama. I mean, these are, these are real partnerships. These are real love matches. And also in modern times, political powerhouses like an, a John Adams and, and Abigail Adams or, you know, like a JFK and, and Jacqueline Kennedy, things like that. The people that really seem to be be out on the campaign trail and working for each other. But the Reagan story is just one for the ages. It's just it's it's borderline ridiculous. You read the letters and you look at it and it's just like, I mean, this isn't, you know, you kind of expect it back in the 1700s. People to be like, oh, if I could die without, you know, it's all very Shakespearean and very right. flowery and Victorian and but the Reagans would write letters to each other. They spent a lot of time apart as he was governor and president of the Screen Actors Guild and did a lot of traveling and even as, as president. But I liken them sort of to a to a, a Paul and Linda McCartney that, that like they just were inseparable. They were really finishing each other's sentences when they were out to dinner, not with themselves. They wrote letters to each other as if they were there at the table. Oh, I had the such and such and you wouldn't have liked it because it was too salty, but you would have loved the soup. And then we would have laughed at this guy in a funny hat across the bar. They're, they're really just it's it is very endearing and very humanizing. It makes me like the presidents more to get to know the women a that they were married to more. <laughs> very good point. Well, you know, as a lot of people do, is that the, the ladies always poll better than the husbands anyway. They're True. not in an elected position. They are the highest ranking unelected official potentially in the country. You take someone like Bess Truman who comes in after Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt, the longest sitting first lady. FDR was elected to four terms, an unprecedented four terms, dies very early on in his fourth term as president, 12 years the same president, and thus 12 years the same first lady. He wouldn't have been president if it wasn't for Eleanor Roosevelt. He had contracted polio. FDR's a mama's boy. Sarah Roosevelt, his mom, basically pulled him out of public life and was like, that's it. You're just going to be a rich guy that hangs out in big houses and has parties. And you've got polio and you've done your bit and the Roosevelts have done their bit. But if that's the case, then Eleanor's trapped in there with him. So she becomes his legs literally and figuratively, and hires this political genius powerhouse, a guy from Bethesda, Maryland, to come up and really prop him up and get him back out there. And then we have the longest sitting president in history. But um, Eleanor Roosevelt and people like that, Bess Truman, these influences that they have over the husband, Bess Truman comes in after Eleanor Roosevelt, so visual, and she's a backseat. She, she steps out of the limelight. She doesn't like it. But she is she and Harry Truman have been together or have at least had their eyes on each other since kindergarten school in Independence, Missouri at, at, a, at a Presbyterian church, like sort of like a basement daycare kindergarten kind of thing. They, they get together, start dating as teenagers, and they never looked at another person. I mean, there, there's speculation, probably accurate speculation, that she was in on decisions about the bomb. In World War II, I, I mean, they, these women sleep in the same beds as their husbands. Think about you with your significant other, anyone out there with a significant other. You share things, you bounce things off people, and it's been happening since day one. It should not be a surprise that these women are so influential. And so unusual for their time. Indeed. Well, Andrew Oak, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I, I really have enjoyed getting to know our first ladies better, and I look forward to the following volumes and, and getting to know them all a little better, too. Wonderful. Thanks for coming in today. Thanks for having me in. WYPR's Lisa Morgan spoke with Andrew Oak. His book is called Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. We've got a link to more information on our website, wypr.org slash Marilyn Morning. I'm Tom Hall. You're listening to Maryland Morning. By the way, we'd love to hear from you about stories you've heard here on Maryland Morning or stories you'd like to hear. You can contact us on our website. You can send us a tweet at Maryland Morning. You can tweet me at Tom Hall, WIPR, and our email address is mdmorning at wipr.org. Coming up after a break for the news, theater critic Jay Wynn Russick brings us a preview of this year's Baltimore Playwrights Festival. But first, it's time now for the environment in focus. <laughs> 